this unit is all about sampling, using a sample to represent an entire population, because quite often we don't have the time or resources to contact every single person in a population. Now in our first example, we're not dealing with a population of people, we are dealing with a population of marbles. We have a large bowl with 200 marbles, exactly 100 red, exactly 100 blue. The true proportion of red marbles in the bowl is 0.5, and we're going to call that P. This is an example of a parameter, and this is not a new vocab word, we've done this before. A parameter is anything that describes the population. So here's a couple examples we've seen already. Mu describes the mean of the population. We also have P, which is a proportion that describes the population, and we have sigma, which is a standard deviation from the entire population. Now, you are going to take a sample of 20 marbles and find the proportion of red in your sample of 20. And whatever proportion you get, we call that p hat. Now, this is not a parameter. This is called a statistic. Once again, not a new vocab word. A statistic is anything that describes the sample. Some examples that we've seen already would be x bar, which was a mean, p hat, which is a proportion, and s, which is a standard deviation. So notice a couple things here parameter and population, statistic and sample. Easy to remember because they start with the same letters. Also the parameters get the fancy Greek letters and the, well, other than this, um, and the statistics get the bars and hats and decorations. All right, imagine doing this many times. You select 20 marbles, you calculate p hat, you add it to a dot plot, you put all the marbles back, you shuffle them up and you do it again. Pause the video and make just a rough sketch of what that would look like. Where would it be centered? Would it be spread out? Would it be skewed? Would it be symmetric? Just kind of guess what you think it would look like. So probably your dot plot is going to be centered around 0.5 because most of the time you will get a p hat around 0.5 or 50%. Sometimes you might get a particular sample that has more red or less red, but most of the time you'll be close to 0.5. I would also say that this is going to be roughly symmetric because you're mostly getting close to 50%. Now, repeatedly taking a sample of the same size over and over and over can lead you to what's called a sampling distribution. The definition of a sampling distribution is so important that I typed it for you. A sampling distribution is the distribution of values taken by the statistic, in this case p hat, in all possible samples of the same size from the same population. So let's look at an example here. On the left, we have the population distribution of the red and the blue marbles. So 50% are blue, 50% are red. The true parameter P is 0.5. Then here's three different sample distributions. Maybe the first time we take out 20 marbles, we get 40% red. We put those back. The second time we get 55% red, put them back. The third time we get 65% red. Each one of these is called a sample distribution and it's just showing you what the distribution looks like from each particular sample. Now to get a true sampling distribution, you have to take every single sample of size 20 that is available to you. That means you'd probably have to lay out all the marbles, number them from one to 200, use some computer software, I guess, to come up with every single combination of 20 marbles that you could take, and then painstakingly go through one at a time and calculate p hat and all of those. Yeah, that's not, something anyone would actually do, we would have a computer do that for us. On the right, you can see what the sampling distribution of p hat would look like. So once again, these were sample distributions. This is the sampling distribution. Now there are so many samples on here that it's hard to tell that this is even a dot plot, but these are dots here. They've just all kind of merged into one bar. <laughs> Take a moment and answer number two on your own. What would each of those dots represent in the sampling distribution? So each dot in the sampling distribution represents a sample proportion, p hat, from a sample of size 20. And there's a lot of them. <laughs> Let me say that one more time. Every dot represents a p hat, or a sample proportion, from a different sample. Before I go on, I just want to point out the difference between the word sampling and sample. If you say sample distribution, you are talking about a single sample and an AP grader is going to read it as such. Sampling distribution is the distribution of p hats from all possible samples of the same sample size. So be really careful with abbreviating the word sampling, because if you just write S-A-M-P dot, like are they talking about sample or sampling? It's kind of a big deal. So unfortunately you have to write that whole word out most of the time. 
Feel free to abbreviate distribution, D-I-S-T. That's fine, but sample versus sampling is actually a big deal. Okay, now let's think back to our crazy in love lesson. In that lesson, you were selecting five random words from crazy in love, calculating the mean, or X bar, from that sample, and then we put all of our data together into one dot plot. So think about that dot plot. Did we create the true sampling distribution of the mean word length for um, samples of size five? We did not look at every single sample of size five. So what we found was an approximation. So the answer was no, it was not the true sampling distribution. It was an approximation because we took many different samples of size five, but not all samples of size five. So if you recall, there were, we did this twice. We did it once where you were just choosing words. We did it once where you were actually randomly selecting words. Each dot of the dot plot represents a different sample. In this case, it was X bar. It was a mean length of a word. It wasn't a P hat, but same idea. Each dot represents an individual sample. And I did not make you find every possible sample of size five, because that would have taken you till now, a couple months. <laughs> Instead, we just took many, many samples of size five. So in reality, that's a little bit more realistic, either taking many, many samples or having a computer create a sampling distribution for you. So that's the difference between a true sampling distribution and an approximate sampling distribution. Okay, we're on a roll with um, revisiting old lessons, so why don't we revisit um, that Pokemon example that we did way back in Unit 1. So this should be a link in your notes. I forgot to make it a link in mine. So if you click on that, it'll take you to a spreadsheet of the Pokemon data. Now this is a little bit different than the last time we worked with this data, so what you should do is go up to File, make a copy, and then you'll be able to mess with it. Um, what we want to do is take a random sample of Pokemon. And we're going to calculate two things with that sample. We're going to calculate the sample mean, or X bar, and we're also going to calculate the sample range, which is just the maximum HP in that sample minus the minimum in the sample. Now to do this, you can see I've already done some. What you do is you right click or click with two fingers on column B, choose randomize range. It'll shuffle around the HP. This box here is finding the average of B2 through B5, which is the first four Pokemon. So this is how we're taking our sample. We're shuffling the whole list, and then the first four in the list are our sample. In this cell, it's going to calculate the mean of those first four Pokemon, and in this cell, it's calculating the range. It's taking the max minus the min. When you've randomized, you've selected a new sample of four. It does this calculation for you. What you should do is add this data to the bottom of your list. Now you can't copy paste because if you copy paste and then rearrange this, the numbers that you paste will change because the formula, you're copy pasting the formula. So you just need to type, so 63.75. Okay, now I already have a bunch of data in here for you. So in your copy, why don't you add five or six just so that you have a little bit more um, at the bare minimum. If you want, if you have time, go all out, add 20 more. Once you've done that, what we need is a dot plot of these sample means and the sample ranges, and you can do that in Staplet. It's been a while, but you go to staplet.com, you click on one quantitative variable, and then you're just gonna copy this, all this data, and paste it here, and you can make a dot plot, and also note the mean. If you look at the notes, the notes say to do a sketch of the distribution and then also write down what the mean is. So you're doing that for the sample means and for the sample ranges. Once you have those drawn and the means noted, um, you can answer number four. Now notice I did include the true mean, the parameter. This is the true mean HP for all Pokemon and the true range for all Pokemon. So just to recap, add six or seven data points to the spreadsheet, copy paste the sample means into Staplet, sketch and jot down the mean, copy paste the sample ranges into Staplet, sketch, jot down the mean, and then answer number four. Okay, go team. Ready, break. Okay, so at the time of filming, this is what my distribution of X bars looks like. Now notice I'm calling this an approximate sampling distribution of X bar, because it's not every single sample of size 4, it's just some. So it's an approximate sampling distribution. The mean for my sampling distribution was 51.344. Notice that I've now called this mu X bar. This is the typical notation you use when you're talking about the mean of the sampling distribution of X bar. 
That's a lot of words to say, so the symbol is really nice. This means the mean of the sampling distribution of X bar. Okay, at the time of filming, this is what my sample range looked like, and the mean of the sampling distribution of the sample range was 61.808. Okay, so let's just compare these parameters. The original mean, the true mean of the entire population, is 53.5. That's not that far away from 51.34. This is actually pretty good. It's not perfect, but that's a pretty good estimate of mu. The range, on the other hand, the true range from the entire population was 150, and... Oh, not great. <laughs> so the sample range did not represent the true range very well. Now, in both of these cases, we're using X bar, we're using range as estimates of a true parameter. Sometimes you see it referred to as a point estimate. When we're asked if these statistics accurately predicted the true parameters, I would say X bar predicted mu pretty well. 51 is very nearly 53. That's not bad. However, I would say the sample range did not predict the true range very well. And if you think about it, that makes sense. In a sample of size 4, one outlier, yes, it's going to drag X bar towards the outlier, but it's going to really mess up the range. Because X bar predicted mu so well, we call it a unbiased estimator. The definition of an unbiased estimator is the mean of the sampling distribution of that estimator is equal to the true parameter. And that's what we saw here. The mean of this approximate sampling distribution was very close to the true mean of the population. Now, the sample range is what we would call a biased estimator because it is consistently too low or too high. In this case, we can see that it is consistently too low. In fact, I didn't get any with the true range of 150. Maybe you have some by the time you've done this, but for me, I didn't even get the true range. And it makes sense that this would always be below 150, because it's literally impossible for me to take a sample of 4 and get a range that's bigger than 150. In fact, most of the time I'm going to get very small ranges because most of those Pokémon had really small HP values and there were a couple big outliers. So most of the time I'm going to get like 20, 30, 35, and every now and then I get like two extreme Pokemon and I end up with something closer to the true range. Now when we're talking about biased and unbiased estimators, this is different than the bias associated with sampling methods. So two units ago we talked about like non-response and wording of the question and voluntary response and convenience sampling. Those are all types of bias that have to do with your sampling methods. This type of bias is telling us if a statistic is good at predicting a parameter. Okay, using what you know about variability, illustrate the four scenarios below on the targets. So pause the video and take a moment to try that on your own. For some reason, bias and variability always get mixed up, um, so I think it's worth it just to look at these examples. When you have high bias, which is both of these targets on the left, you'll notice that the points are consistently not where they're supposed to be. On the right, we have low bias, and you can see that the points are consistently where they're supposed to be around the target. So bias describes if the estimate is consistently correct or consistently too high or too low. Now variability we've already talked about quite a bit in, in this course. So you can see in the top two targets, high variability means the dots are spread out. In this example, they are centered around the center of the target, and in this one they are centered elsewhere, but in both they are spread out from each other. Whereas down here, for low variability, um, they're close together. So here we have high bias, they're consistently not where they're supposed to be, but low variability, they're kind of tightly um, packed together. And here is the ideal. You have a statistic that has low bias, it's right where it's supposed to be, and low variability. There's not a lot of difference in those dots, they're tightly packed. I think the most important thing in this video is the definition of a sampling distribution, and specifically this graphic, which I can't get to be... Sorry, I'm going to cover up part of it. This is huge. You have to understand what a sampling distribution is in order to do any of the analysis that we are about to do. Like, literally about to do. When I was in college, I did not spend a lot of time and energy on statistics because I was taking this proofwriting class and it was notoriously hard and I am a little bit competitive and really wanted to get an A in that class. Which I did! At the expense of my statistics grade, which wasn't the best, um, so I can tell you from personal experience that not understanding what a sampling distribution is 
just, it's not good. <laughs> if this doesn't make sense, it's really important that you ask your teacher, you watch someone else explain it, you watch this video again, because everything else we do builds on this concept of a sampling distribution. So if this makes sense, you're in good shape, and if it doesn't, don't lose hope. Um, ask some questions, find other resources, and make sure you get this ironed out before you get too far ahead in future videos.